when you want. Okay, so first of all, good afternoon everybody and thank you very much to the organizers for this kind invitation. Thank you also to my moderators. I would like to have done a live case, but as you know, this is a very rare disease, penile cancer, so we were not lucky and we did not find any candidate for this meeting. But I think on the other hand that this format of semi-live can be also a good idea to try to show you how I do modified inguinal robotic lymphadenectomy and also to show some tips and tricks. So if you want, if you can run the video, so you can start the video for me, please. Okay, so I'm gonna present um, a modified robotic inguinal lymphadenectomy. Later I will explain you a little bit more about the case, but now I will start to show you patient position. Patient's position is completely the same that we do for robotic radical prostatectomy using this bootlet holder that you know very well. In that case, it's very important once you have placed the patient like this to flex the knee a little bit more in order to have the limb completely parallel to the floor. And in this surgery, as you can see here, I'm using the X system, the, the X platform. So I have to place the patient shard on the left and the right side of the patient in order to go to the left side. Keep in mind this scarf that you can see here on the left limb. Later I will explain you why it's there. So first of all, before placing the trockers, I think it's very important to mark the landmarks of my surgical field of the groin. So cranially, we will have the inguinal ligaments or popars ligaments. Medially, I have already painted the landmark of the long adductor muscle. And then laterally, we have the sartorius muscle. It's also important and I like to do it always, try to look for the, um, the beating of the femoral artery. I think it's very important to have the reference of where is located the femoral artery and it will help me a lot during the dissection. Um, I will not be able to see where it is because I will be in the console, but it's very nice and very helpful if you can ask to the system where are you located, if laterally or medially to the artery, so I just moving the endoscope, I, 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 the, my assistant using transillumination can tell me if I'm laterally or medially, which I think is very important. So first of all, I will place my camera trocar at the vertice of this isosceles triangle, as you can see here. And then I will place two trockers, two, two more robotic trockers, and then another four trocar for my assistant, a five millimeter trocar that I'm gonna place it between my camera trocar and my right arm. I do a small incision in the vertice of this triangle, and then I use a Metzenbauer scissor just to do a small dissection of the subcutaneous tissue. And then I start to do a blunt dissection with my finger, and it's very important not to open the scarpus fascia. So try to keep above the scarpus fascia not open. When you have already create a little bit of a space. I like to use at the beginning this trocar balloon. It's a 12 millimeter trocar balloon. It's very important because I need to don't have any air leakage. And at the beginning, I, I like to work with high pressure and maximum flow because the space is very reduced and it's very difficult. And most in these cases, like this young guy, where the subcutaneous tissue is a, is a lot of stuck in the scarpus fascia. At the beginning, have you seen here, I'm introducing gas inside, but I cannot create the space. So I use my endoscope to try to deattach the subcutaneous tissue um, attached to the scarpa. And then I'm planning where to place my robotic trockers. So it's very important to respect eight centimeters distance between trockers. If not, you will have clutching. So I'm gonna place the left, the left arm where I have done the incision. And then I remove the, the, the trocar balloon and I place the rest of the trockers under, under finger control. And it's very important, again, not to damage or not to open the scarpus fascia. Here you can see very well, here I'm placing my left arm, which is gonna be medially. 
And then I also use this five millimeter stroker with balloon for my assistant. This balloon, it's, I think it's very useful, this type of strokers when you are working in extra peritoneal spaces because first of all, with the balloon, you avoid any air leakage. And apart from that, you only have a small or half centimeter tip of the balloon inside of the, your surgical field that I think it's very interesting when you have very reduced space. So it's the ones that I use when I go to the retroperitoneal access for partial nephrectomies or when I do pro, um, laparoscopic extraperitoneal radical prostatectomies. So now I have four trockers already placed. Now I'm doing the docking. If it was an XI, the docking could be much easier because then you can place the robot between the legs of the patients and you can go to one side and then to the other one just without not moving the patient chart. In this case, it's a little bit more difficult. So if you want to go to the other side, you have to move the patient chart. But we'll, we will start with this left side. I will explain you a little bit. So now I'm gonna move to the, to the console to start with the case. I have my endoscope inside. At the beginning, it's very important to have almost the trockers out. So, because if not, you are not able to start to move your instruments because, you know, you have to introduce a little bit more. Okay, so this is the first endoscopic view that we have from of this case. On the bottom of the field, of my surgical field, I will have the scarpa fascia that you can see very well. On the top, up on my field, I, we will have all the lymphatic tissue that I have to remove. At the beginning, my target at that point of the surgery, my targets are three. First of all, try to create a little bit more of a space in order to try to work comfortable and to have good ergonomy with my three arms. And also, apart from that, try to create this posterior plane. So I'm gonna follow the scarpa fascia and this is the first dissection of the posterior plane that later will facilitate me to remove all the lymphatic tissue I have on the top of my surgical field. And the third target at that point would be following this scarpa fascia, which is gonna be my limer, try to identify, not to dissect because it's probably not necessary, but try to identify the femoral artery that we have said before that it's very important. Why it's very important? First of all, because if you have identified, um, it's, you are decreasing the risk of possible or complex complications that it can appear. And apart from that, it's very interesting because for example, in this case, that it's gonna be a modified inguinal lymphadenectomy, I know that I don't need to go laterally to the artery. So once I have identified the femoral artery, then I know that I have to move medially. All the specimen will be immediately to my femoral artery. Why is gonna be a modified thing in a lymphadenectomy? I'm gonna, explain, I'm gonna explain now the case. So this is a young guy, 50 years old, that I performed one month before the surgery, um, a glandectomy for penile cancer. It was a PT2. At that time, he didn't have palpable nodes. So in our protocol, when, when you have a clinical in zero, so the palpable nodes, they, they are not palpable nodes. We perform sentinel node biopsy. I did sentinel node biopsy simultaneously to the glandectomy, but on the right side it was negative, but on the left side it didn't work, sentinel node biopsy. And be careful with that. We know that when sentinel node biopsy doesn't work, be careful because one of the reasons could be that the sentinel node is blocked by tumor. So then it's mandatory, mandatory if you go to the guidelines, it's mandatory to go to a modified inguinal lymphadenectomy. You can do it endoscopically, open, or robotic like in this case. And this was the reason because that patient had a scarf on the limb, left limb, because in that patient, it was really young, 50 years old. So when I did the glandectomy, I performed at the same time um, a bracket reconstruction. And this was the scarf of the graft that I got from the left limb. So now, have you seen here, I'm going on working on this plane. It's very important not to open the scarpa fascia. If you open, try to go back to your plane. 
And now I'm looking for the femoral artery. Here I have a, a vein, probably a small vein that is draining to the, um, to the saphenous arch. I, th I don't think it's the saphenous vein. It's very small. And I don't know that then if here I have a vein, my artery is going to be just behind of my, of my scissor. So I'm going to work in that corner in order to try to identify where is the femoral artery. Here, for example, I'm, I'm opening scarpus fascia. This is a mistake. I thought that the femoral artery was there, and I tried to look at it, but it was not there, so I was completely lost. And this is the moment where you have to ask to your assistant, look, I'm going to move the endoscope to the right and to the left, and using transillumination, please tell me if I have to go medially or more laterally. And probably I'm too medially to find the artery, so the artery, in my opinion, now that I know exactly where the artery is, this is one of the vantage of semi-life, is more laterally. So I try to go back to my, to my plane. If it was a radical inguinal lymphonectomy, then you have to open the scarpus fascia, but in this case, it's not necessary, and it's very important not to do it in order to decrease the risk of complications and morbidity in the, in the post-op of these patients. So here I have the, this, this, this vein, that another option is try to follow the vein, because if you follow that vein, I know that it will drain to the saphenous arch, and then laterally to the saphenous arch, I will have the, the artery. I tried to combine mono, uh, that part of the surgery, tried to combine monopolar, and also I use bipolar. I like the tip of the Maryland to do what I have done right now to dissect. So it's very interesting, this maneuver. And you just can do blunt dissection and dissection, and then use monopolar to try to have the surgical field as much dry as possible in order to have a good view. Try to be gently when you approach to the, to the vessels because if you have a bleeding, because the space is so reduced and the gas that we have inside is not a, a lot of gas, so if your assistant needs to start to suck, you will lose the, the space and it will start to bleed, so and this can be a problem. So look at there. At the end of my, be, uh, of my field, I can see something beating. This is the femoral artery. Probably that's enough just to know where it is. I will dissect a little bit more in this case just to show you that this is the femoral artery, but you can see very well. So just to be orientated on the right of your of your vision, you have the femoral artery. So the vein is going to be there when I'm dissecting right now. And the saphenous vein, they're going to be even more medially. So going to the left of your, of your view. Have you seen the system is now at that point of the surgery very comfortable because he's pointing with the sucker from up to down. So he doesn't need to go to the top of my surgical field, which is going to be a little bit more difficult for him because of the, of the rigid um, instruments that he's using. So now here I will have the vein. And that's all. Now I have created the posterior plane. I know where is the artery, where is the vein, and then I know that all the lymphatic tissue that I have to remove 
remove all my specimen is gonna be on the top of my field. So once I finish that, I will leave this plane and I will go up. Have you seen now that the space that I have created it's enough to work comfortable. Now I can triangulate with both hands and I decrease the pressure once I have created enough space to eight, nine millimeters, probably this is enough. And you decrease the risk of retention of CO2 of these patients, which is very high, like in all surgeries that we are not doing transperitoneal. Are you planning to excise the saphenous vein with the uh, lymph node packet or preserve it? No, I'm gonna preserve. Uh, you will see now, it's very interesting, I think, in modified inguinal lymphonectomy, where you don't need to sacrifice, it's very interesting if you can preserve the saphenous vein, the main saphenous vein, and as much as collateral as possible in order to try to decrease the risk of lymphedema. Lymphedema is something very, very rare when you do modified inguinal lymphonectomy if you go do a good preservation of the, of the saphenous vein. So the femoral vein is there. And now I have complete changed my plane. Now I left the, the scarpus fascia at the bottom of my surgical field. And now I have to go to the to the top of my surgical field. Here we have all the lymphatic tissue and also the saphenous vein. This is probably a saphenous vein that you were asking me about. And it's very important if you can dissect, but don't miss or leave lymphatic tissue around. So I'm using the bipolar now as a, a retractor and a dissector. I have not started to use any clip at that point, so all the dissection that I've done from the posterior plane, I don't use clips because you only have tissue attached, but there you don't have any nodes and lymphatic vessels, so it's not necessary. But now, at this point, I think it's important to start to use clips. One of the main problems of this surgery is still lymphorrhea and lympho cell. I think that with minimal invasive techniques, we have decreased or even reduced close to zero complications, skin complications, but lymphorrhea and lympho cell is still very, very high. So uh, I did many many trials and, and many tests, how to try to solve that, um, using clips, using hemologs, using sealers on my right hand when I'm going um, endoscopically. Um, at the end of this case, place, flu seal, many, many, many different tricks that I was thinking that they could help me. And one of the last things that I did, because I read it from a paper where, where they doing opening in a lymphonectomy is at the end of the case is to place a stitch and fix the camper fascia with the scarpa with two B-logs. But in my opinion, nothing works. And I invite you, if you are doing cases like this, to try to think all together in a possible solution. What yeah. do you think? Do you have the same feeling, my well, moderators? What one thing that we've done is we've injected ICG uh, onto the skin around the penis to help us locate the lymphatic channels with this. And so then um, as we're doing this dissection, we will uh, turn on the firefly and then individually uh, either coagulate or clip the lymphatic channels as we go through them. Look, I've, I've done the same, but you know, the advantage of, of having both two limbs is that you can that you can do a lot of test using the same patient so it's not a randomized clinical trial but probably it's even much better because it's the same patient 
um, same anatomy, but, and you can test one side and then the other one, and Tobias Machado, who was the first one to describe that, when he started to compare endoscopic with open lymphadenectomy, he, he was doing like that. He was doing opening one side and endoscopic on the other one. So I did what you said. In one, in one limb, in one groin, I'm using ICG at the end of the case and not in the other one, and no differences between <laughs> be, of lymphorrhea and, and lymphocell. So the same days of drainage, same number of lymphocells that they have to to replace a drainage. So I don't know. I, I actually totally agree with you. Uh, we, as we discussed uh, yesterday night, uh, we also tried the, the same approach. Actually, we used the um, endocyanin green to identify the positive nodes, or at least uh, the nodes that uh, were to be removed. And at the end of the surgery, you just uh, remove everything that is green. So uh, <laughs> it's also... No, no, but apart from removing the nodes, I think it's interesting the idea that that he said, which was my idea, to try to clip the, um, the lymphatic vessels that they are open, and yeah. you can see very well, but even I'm doing, uh, I'm not changing my results. So like here we have the campus fascia. So this is the top of my surgical field. Here you have to be careful because this fascia is very, very thin. So if you damage, you can um, open or burn the skin. So try to be gentle here. I'm using energy, but I try to use... Dr. Goya, uh, I spared some, some questions for, for the end of this uh, presentation. However, um, as I started performing this procedure, thanks uh, because of you, uh, I still remember that, that you told us to um, uh, do this surgical step just at the end of the procedure, as you are doing here, which is uh, clever, because otherwise you have all the lymphatic tissue uh, that you bring down in your surgical field. So you have to wait until the posterior plane is done. Yes. That's the, a good trick. Yes, yes. The, I think this is the key of the surgery. It's completely the opposite that you do in when you go open. So you have to start down at the, you know, at the, at the bottom of your plane in the scarpus fascia. And then when you have already developed this posterior plane, go up and then try to connect campus fascia with with scarpus fascia, and then there you have everything. Have you seen here? I can preserve many of these um, branches that they are draining all of them to the saphenous um, arch. With regard to vessel sparing, I mean, uh, sparing uh, veins, uh, do you have the feeling that this uh, really helps uh, with lymphorrhea? Because uh, it, is, it was described, but I don't have this. Mm. My feeling is that veins, they decrease the risk. If you preserve veins, they, you decrease the risk of lymphedema, but not lymphocell and lymphorrhea. Because, for example, I, I don't want to, to say anything about the final results of this patient, but in this patient that you will see that they preserve probably 90% of the veins that go to the saphenous arch. Or, or 80 percent because I preserve five or six. I don't remember. In this patient, I had to to leave drainage for three weeks because lymphorrhea was so important. I have some care patients that they have um, they are draining during two or three weeks, 300, 400 per day, which is a lot. So I use this small metallic clip, the same that we use for robotic radical prostatectomy when we are doing the, the nerve sparing. Have you seen here my assistant? It seems that he is a, a junior resident, but he's not. He's a, a, a staff with good, I would say, good laparoscopic skills. And have you seen that it's very difficult for him to place the, the clips and he's trembling and it's difficult for him. The problem is that it's very difficult to work with endoscopic instruments on the top of your field because you have to basculate a lot. And this is probably the main advantage for me of robotics um, compared with pure endoscopic is that when you ho will have to go to the, this part of the surgery that you have to dissect all this lymphatic tissue that is attached to the campus fascia, when I go lab or when I go with pure endoscopic, 
it's very difficult for me to go up because I have to basculate and the handles of my instruments, of ligature, of the scissors, or even my hand, sometimes you have continuous clutching with the limb of the patient or with the knee of the patient. And sometimes you are not completely doing ergonomic movements. And th this is what is happening now to my assistant. You will see here again. What about uh, surgical time? I mean, uh, did you find uh, the, the, the time were longer using the robotic approach compared to lap? Probably the, the, the docking is, uh, now I'm doing very fast and probably uh, you are right that probably it's 10 minutes more, but not more than 10 minutes. And I don't know at the end if I gain um, time during my dissection. Now that we are comparing and we have um, a big database on that, we have seen that more or less the surgical time when Google robot or lab is the same. What about center volume? I mean, uh, do you think that this kind of surgery can be handled by all the surgeons, uh, the urologists, or should they be, this patient, be referred to referral centers? I think this is a minimally invasive technique that the learning curve is not very difficult, so almost all of the urologists that they are doing lab or robotics, they can be able to, to learn it. But the problem is that if you have so many, so, so few cases per year that sometimes it's difficult to get experience on that. Um, for example, now in, in our hospital, we are a referral center and we are doing between 15 and 20 cases per year, which is probably the hospital in Spain who is doing more cases. But now we have review, for example, in, um, using one of the platforms of our national association, we have reviewed all patients diagnosed with painful cancer in 2017 in Spain. And it's incredible different treatments that they have received. Um, only uh, between 20 and 25 of them, they have a good clinical staging of the groin. So I think it's very important to start to centralize these patients. And we have evidence in the literature that countries like uh, United Kingdom or even Italy that they have started to, to, to use and to follow the, the guidelines. They have increased the, the invasive staging of the groin from 20, 25%, almost 60%. So I think this is very important because if not these patients, you are under staging and you are under treating. So 20, 30% of patients with clinical N0, so with no palpable nodes, we know that they have micrometastasis. So the only patients that they should not go to, to node staging are that patients with very low risk. On the other hand, I think that the best way to do node staging of the groin in patients with no palpable nodes is sentinel node. And this is also a very easy technique that probably is more important the nuclear medicine guy than the urologist because you just have to follow the higher proof when he's in the field. But you, ha you need to know how to do that because there are some patients that a sentinel node doesn't work. And apart from that, there are some patients that sentinel nodes become positive go back positive and then you have to do a radical inguinal lymphonectomy. So this is probably a big advantage. Look here, I'm, I'm trying to clip as much as possible. It's very important to do a nice dissection. We know also from different studies that, that um, node density is an independent risk factor of recurrence on the groin. And we know that in penal cancer recurrence means decrease cancer specific survival and overall survival. So the guidelines say that at least we have to remove seven nodes per groin when we do when we are doing modified inguinal lymphonectomy. We have reviewed our results. And for example, in the last five years that we are combining endoscopic and robotic, 
the mean of nodes when we do modified inguinal lymphectomy is nine, and when we go for radical inguinal lymphectomy is 12. We were talking last night with Aldo about that. Most of the nodes in the, in the groin, they are in the superficial compartment. So the difference between going to modified or radical, it's, it's not very much. So it's two or three nodes more if you do a good modified inguinal lymphectomy. Concerning uh, radical uh, inguinal lymphadenectomy uh, with a minimal invasive approach, uh, how would you suggest to proceed? I mean, um, I am actually doing first the superficial uh, lymph node dissection, and after that, I perforate the, let's call it uh, scarpa fascia or fasciolata, whatever you want, mm -hmm. and then uh, the, the, deep, the deep part, the, the deepest part. Um, is it feasible, according to your experience, just uh, all together? I mean, uh, going from from deeper to to the superficial part all together. No, I'm doing the same as as you are doing. I think it's the best way to go. Once you have removed all the superficial um, template, then it's very easy. You have the the scarpas fascia completely completely free of lymphatic tissue. And then it's very easy there to open the, the fascia and go to dissect the artery in the vein. <coughs> I completely agree with you. I, the problem is that when you do a modified inguinal lymphadenectomy and the nodes um, become positive, then you have a big problem because then it's very, very difficult to go back to the groin if you have done a modified inguinal lymphadenectomy, endoscopic or robotic, and you have to open the, the fascia lat or, fascia or scarpa's fascia. Then it's very, very difficult. I've done two or three times, but I suffer a lot because everything is stuck. And in one case, I need to open because I was not sure that I was removing all the nodes. But after sentinel node, I have to tell you that after a positive sentinel node, when you have to go back to the groin, eh, I've done many times, and then it's not really difficult. You find the clips that you have already placed during the sentinel node biopsy, but only in just attach it uh, to the scarf that you have on the skin there it's a little bit more tricky, but the rest of the dissection is completely like you are seeing in this case. So now I'm, I'm trying to gain a little bit more of this lymphatic tissue, trying to not open the campus fascia, and at the end of my, of my surgical field, I will see my cranial um, landmark, which uh, I said that it was the Popar's ligament or inguinal ligament, so it's just at the end. Concerning this, uh, considering that we all love uh, anatomy, uh, I have something uh, some, somehow provocative to say. I mean, okay. studying uh, the anatomy of this region, I found out that uh, the uh, so-called uh, Rosenmuller ligament is actually, uh, of course, uh, an inguinal lymph node. It is contained in the inguinal sheet. So, uh, the femoral sheet. It is not possible, according to, to my point of view, to to find it if you are performing a pelvic lymph node dissection. So, all the things that we were said uh, concerning um, prostate cancer, lymphadenectomy, this is the uh, Rosenmuller lymph node. I, I don't think it's true. I mean, uh, I don't think that anybody has ever taken the Rosenmuller lymph node from the pelvis. I don't think it's feasible. What, what's your uh, I, I idea? Well, th there are some people, for example, here there's a guy from Madrid, that, Dr. Subira, that he's also an excellent surgeon, and he's doing a lot of inguinal lymphadenectomies. That, for example, he's removing inguinal and pelvic nodes from a transperitoneal axis. It's true that you can go to the from the from the pelvis to the to the groin, yeah, you, but you, you, not, you, not you, usually yeah. for for prostate cancer. Exactly, not <laughs> usually for prostate cancer. 
it's feasible, so you can cross from one side to the other one, um, just behind the inguinal ligament, but I, I completely agree with you that probably most of the nodes that we are removing during radical prostatectomy, um, no one of them is what you said. And apart from that, recently we, we I read a paper that, for example, um, cl cloquette node that is there and, and during radical prostatectomy, most of the times you reach and you remove when you do lymphadenectomy. Um, most of the time it's negative and probably we should not remove in order to try to decrease the risk of lymphedema of these patients. So I agree with you that the anatomy sometimes it depends who explained you. Eh? The best thing is to go back to the book. It's something that, that we that I had to do for for starting this kind of procedure because I've never seen it before. So So have you seen here on the left or, or image you can see very well that I have preserved many, many veins. Yeah, it's very nice. Um, are you gonna you gonna do the other side at the same time? No, because it, it's what I told you about this case. This case, uh, the sentinel node on the right side was negative. So oh. it, it. But if it, but if it was, um, you know, uh, if that wasn't the case for this particular case in general, do you do both at the same time? Yes, yes, yes. But for example, I I have to say to you that when I go bilateral, you know, that there are. For example, in patients that sentinel node is not feasible or or it doesn't work in bilateral or or patients that they have palpable nodes that I'm going to do radical bilateral lymphonectomy. When it's bilateral, I prefer to go endoscopically because as Tobias Machado, who was the first to describe this technique in 2006, he also started to do and he also published three or four cases of simultaneous video endoscopic inguinal lymphadenectomy. So now I have trained one of my young colleagues at Puigver, and now we are performing simultaneous inguinal lymphadenectomy, but using two towers of endoscopy, probably two robots would be too expensive. And we have seen that with this technique using um, or doing simultaneous bilateral inguinal lymphadenectomy, we are saving time, so we have reduced time to, to the half, and we are not increasing cost because we are only using three trockers more that I cannot pass from one groin to the other one. But for example, we are sharing the, the, suck, the sucker, we are sharing the nurse, and the only thing that we need is another, another cameraman. So two sergeants, two cameramans, so two teams, one in each limb. And then another thing that we were afraid when we started, we were really happy because we had reduced the, the time to, um, to, to help. One of the things that we had a little bit of fear or we were afraid was the risk of um, retention of CO2 of these patients because we are insufflating at the same time um, in both in both limbs. And we were surprised because the anesthesiologists they did a, a good a good work and they started to ask for emo gas um, at the end of all cases. And what we have observed is that when we are doing bilateral inguinal lymphadenectomy uh, one 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 before and then the contralateral one. So because it takes us more or less four hours, the time that you are insufflating is more dangerous than doing in two hours. So at the end, it's it's better for the patient because the the results of the MO gas were there were much better when I were doing some uh, simultaneous bilateral inguinal lymphadenectomy. So the patients, they can extubate before, and also they have less, less retention of CO2. Do, do you have any experience or uh, some comments on the lateral approach? I mean, uh, placing the trockers uh, along the um, uh, lateral aspect of the, of the tie? Which is something that, that is done, for example, uh, from uh, by, by uh, few um, 
Indian uh, urologists. Uh, I think it could be interesting uh, to avoid clashing uh, if you are working on the two tights together with the double uh, equip, the double surgical team. No, we don't have clutching because, you know, both surgeons, they are placed in the um, laterally to the limb. So it's only the, it's only the cameraman and we open uh, legs. Well, we don't have problems of clutching and we place the nurse in the middle, but just behind us. So we don't have problems on that. Okay. The only problems that I have when I go pure endoscopic is what I told you, that when I have to go to the top of my surgical field, sometimes I need to to move the table, also do trend or anti-trend in order to try to to decrease this clutching with the with the handles. Even for example, I was using Ligasure, but Ligasure is so big, the handle of Ligasure, that now I have changed to um, to unseal because it's a little bit smaller, so then I have less clutching. So I'm almost done. I'm finishing the dissection of these nodes that I still have attached in one of these branches close to the femur um, saphenous arch. So this, so this is for staging. We have palpable nodes that you want to do radical. You would also start uh, endoscopically, robotically. Uh, for those cases, what are the times when you would do an open operation? Open operation, uh, we only reserve for patients that they are clinical C3 that they don't want to go to chemotherapy, but that they are completely fixed. But um, five or six years ago, um, I had the idea or we had the idea that when nodes were palpable, you could not go endoscopically. And this is not true. So minimal invasive techniques, they are approved and safe for clinical N1 and clinical N2. The only thing that you cannot do is clinical N3 because it's completely fixed and it's, 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 it's impossible to remove. It's even difficult to do it open, no? But I'm, I'm also, I'm also doing open when I, when I do that. And the other thing is what I told you before. The other scenario is when I have done modified thinginal lymphadenectomy using minimal invasive technique, and then the nodes come back that they are positive. Go back there with minimal invasive technique is very, very difficult. So then I do the, or I complete the, um, the lymphadenectomy, the, the deeper compartment open. Have you tried uh, insufflating below scarpus when you when you do that? Sometimes in 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 two cases, I've done three cases like this. In two cases, uh, I manage a little bit, but in the third case, it was very difficult. But I completely agree with you. When you do the access, instead of trying not to open the scarpa fascia, you have to open, and then you have to place the gas there, and this is an option. But even and another thing that I think it's 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 really important is that when you go back to to complete or to remove the nodes that you have in the deeper compartment many of the times you found a lot of <laughs> positive nodes in the superficial compartment so that means that you have not done a previous good job so here uh, i'm almost done in this case i the number of nodes removed was 10. I told you that our average was is nine in the last review that we have done of the last five years. In this case, I removed 10 nodes and all of them, they were negative. So this guy finally was a PT2 in the penis, N0, sentinel node negative on the right side, a modified inguinal lymphonectomy with 10 nodes negative. So I think we have done a correct staging of this guy. I think it's also very important, apart from these minimal invasive techniques on the groin, is to start to do more reconstructions and more BRCA techniques, especially in patients that they are young. For example, this guy, 50 years old, 
Um, well, we have a lot of experience in in BRCAS reconstruction. We are doing a lot of resurfacing in patients with CIS, multiple CIS on the gland, and also in patients that you need to do glandectomy for, for PT2. Uh, that, that's a very good point. I, I think that uh, probably um, starting to send the patient to referral centers, this is something that, that we could change and improve because um, most of the surgeon probably they don't have a, a the required skill for plastic surgery so reconstructive surgery completely agree one of the things now that you are talking about plastic surgeons one of the projects that now we have started to develop is to try to work with them in order to try to decrease the risk of lymphedema and lympho cell so we are planning to try to do some vascular lymphatic anastomosis, so the same that they are doing for breast cancer. But I think it's a little bit difficult and it will increase a lot uh, the surgical time. But I think that we have to do something to try to solve this problem. Here, for example, have you seen when I'm close to the, to the femoral vein and to the femoral artery, here I place plenty of hemologs in order to try to decrease the risk of lympho cell and lympho rea. Okay, so I think that is done, everything is done. As you can see here, all the specimen I could remove in block using this rolling technique from passing to one side to the other side of the veins in order to preserve. And here I have uh, the whole specimen. Then I introduce this and the bag that I like very much that you can throw through the eight millimeter stroker of the robot so you don't need to place another bigger stroker for that. So you can use the, this, this endo bag. Apart from that, it's really cheap. And this is the final image. Have you seen here? Here we have the artery. I'm gonna show you for last time, so I don't need to go laterally to the artery because this is a modified thing in a lymphonectomy. So now I place the specimen in the, the back and then I remove it through the, the trocar of the camera, which is where I had the bigger incision. And then I place um, a drainage for at least one week. And then I don't remove the drainage and it's forbidden and the nurses and re the residents, they know that, that it's not allowed to remove the drainage before three days with less than 20 cc's per day. Because if you remove it before, you will have lymphorrhea, a lympho cell, and then you will need to do another percutaneous, uh, place another percutaneous drainage. And that's all. If you have any other questions or... or do you have any uh, comments on uh, reconstruction? Because uh, I think it's it's important. It's the same, uh, is as important as lymphadenectomy, of course, not not for oncological reason, but for cosmetic uh, results. It's it's important. I mean, you survive a cancer, but at, at the end. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, uh, for example, all the patients that we have performed BRCA technique, um, we are following, and we have we have they have completed. Um, a questionnaire about sexual activity, about mm, you know um, physical physical appearance, everything. And for example, of the patients that we have performed BRCA, 70% of them they still have sexual relations. You know, this is very important. All these patients that you do glandectomy and you don't do any type of reconstruction, probably all of them or most of them they don't go back to to have sexual activity you know and this is important this guy was 50 years old and yeah we we have a large gender affirming surgery center in our institution so we'll we'll offer phalloplasty in addition if the shaft's too short yes the the problem with phalloplasty that i think that it's also very interesting is that patients that they are pt3 you know, that you need to do a a penectomy, right. you have to very sure. You have it's to be very, very sure very because can be tricky. Patient. Yes, but it can be very tricky. No, um, if you have a local recurrence there, for then it's a big drama. So yeah. probably 
you can offer reconstruction, but two after later. two years, yes, which is probably the, the major risk of local recurrence. Okay, I think we are finished. Yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much.